Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. We now continue our weekly Behind the Headline segment with a look at news from a much different angle. That's the sound of St. Louis Public Radio's recently acquired drone. And earlier, I spoke with our data visual journalist, Brent Jones, our drone pilot. I asked him whether drones are a toy or a tool for journalists. They're definitely tools. I mean, most people are probably familiar with them as toys. uh, But for journalists, we like to think of them as, as tools because we can use them to just help tell the story in the best way uh, that we know to tell it. How difficult are they to use? I mean, you just don't uh, go and buy one at the local store and send it up, do you? They have made them easier to use in in recent years, but they do still take uh, a lot of practice. And it kind of depends on the conditions. Um, One of the things, I think, that, that moves them from sort of toy to tool territory is that you really need to know all of the rules and regulations around them, what you're allowed to do, and then be able to find a way to tell the story within those things. Well, you're our designated pilot. What sort of training did you have to go through to to achieve all of this? That's right. Uh, I had to get licensed by the FAA, uh, and that involves studying for a test that they give you and then uh, taking that test. Right now, there's no sort of uh, hands-on Uh, part of that test. So you're not actually demonstrating flying. I think that's because there are so many different kinds of drones out there and and that sort of thing. But they do uh, test you on on knowing all of those regulations and knowing things about uh, airspace and weather and how uh, to safely operate a drone. So you have to learn all of those things. And then after that, you definitely have to practice with the technology to be able to make sure you're flying it safely and getting what we need from the air, which right now is usually photos or video. Give me some examples of how it can be used and how we here at St. Louis Public Radio have used it. Sure. So for right now, mostly what we've done is is taken it up and gotten photos and videos from places where we wouldn't otherwise be able to. Uh, We don't own a helicopter and we haven't rented a helicopter. So this is sort of our option for uh, getting an eye in the sky Earlier this week, uh, Ryan uh, Delaney ran a story about the um, debris from the NGA site being moved to the Pruitt-Igoe site near a school. And we wanted to show the scale of that site, uh, the scope of the um, of the work being done there, and the proximity of that pile to the school. And one of the ways that we were able to do that was uh, by taking the drone up and being able to get an aerial view of that site. Uh, Other places have used it uh, to show things like uh, flooding or the aftermath of natural disasters. Uh, There's been some recent footage of the volcano in Hawaii. So uh, you can use it for a lot of things. Um, And I'm interested in things that we haven't done yet. So things like uh, perhaps hanging a sensor off the bottom of it and flying it to a place that we might not otherwise be able to access, like pollution sensors or temperature sensors or maybe even a microphone. How about nighttime flying? Nighttime flying uh, needs a special waiver from the FAA. So right now we're limited to flying during uh, day from from dawn to dusk. But it is possible uh, to apply for a special waiver for specific times and places to fly at night. This would seem to eliminate what we would call and is often called breaking news, uh, where things would have to be planned and set up previously? Uh, for, the, for the nighttime flying, it, it certainly would. Uh, for daytime flying, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of planning involved, but we're sort of getting it down to where we can accomplish that uh, as quickly as we need to. And as long as where we would like to cover the news is not in, say, controlled airspace around one of our, our airports in the area, uh, we would be able to get out there relatively quickly. I know that the uh, Post-Dispatch, for example, was able to cover the warehouse fire um, just south of, of Grand Center here. Uh, it, this happened several months ago, but they were able to take their drone out and cover that fire using theirs. How, how quickly could we get one up and out? I, I would say uh, with, within the day, uh, depending, again, on, on where the, uh, the 
news was located. Uh, also, weather is a big concern, so we would have to pay attention to the weather, make sure that that's uh, not something that's that's going to affect the drone. And then another thing that, that a lot of people may not realize is that there's a temporary flight restriction in place around Bush Stadium, for example, when the Cardinals are playing. So if from an hour before the game starts, uh, you wouldn't be able to fly very close to the stadium. And, and that actually extends out, I think, three miles. What about the privacy issue that we hear so much about? That's a big concern uh, with regard to these drones. It certainly is. We uh, take that seriously. We want to make sure that what we're doing is responsible and the things that we're covering are newsworthy, and we certainly don't want to invade anyone's privacy uh, while we're doing it. One of the steps that we take when we're planning a story with a drone is we, uh, I have a, a form that the reporter and editor can, can fill out and uh, think through some of these issues. And one of those items is, uh, are there any privacy or ethical issues that we might be able to anticipate, such as flying very close to someone's house? Um, even, if, even if we're not covering something uh, that is for a specific person, if we're covering something across the street from them or next door from them, uh, they may reasonably be concerned about what we're doing there. So uh, we've, we're, we're trying to think through how to... Um, still be able to bring the news uh, to the public, in, but in a responsible way. But is there any restriction about private property? If I'm a farmer and uh, I don't want the drone over there, can I stop it? So a lot of uh, municipalities around here have uh, established rules. Most of them seem to duplicate the FAA's rules, for example, not flying at night um, and that sort of thing. Uh, the FAA says that they are the primary authority for regulating the nation's airspace. So they set the rules once you're in the sky. Um, there are uh, municipalities around who have said you're not allowed to fly over private property without the owner's permission. Um, and that's something that, as far as I know, hasn't been uh, taken to court yet because these uh, these rules are fairly new from the FAA. So. From what I understand from some of the things that I've seen that, that, that you've written, uh, this can also be utilized for graphics, for our online, uh, uh, online uh, postings. Sure. We're, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm very interested in uh, using this for is, uh, for example, building a base layer for a map. So we could build an interactive map uh, to help show where something is or something's boundaries, uh, but use imagery from the drone to uh, to use on that map, uh, just like you may be familiar with Google Maps or Apple Maps and being able to see the background there. Um, one advantage of that would be if there's been a lot of development, as there certainly has been uh, around the St. Louis area, uh, we could go out and get that imagery that is up to date and use that on the map instead of something that may be from a year or two or three uh, ago and not show the current developments in the area. Any other kinds of applications that uh, you can think of where they might be used? Yeah, uh, it's it's really wide open. It's a very new uh, system, and people are coming up with new ideas about how to use it all the time. Uh, I've thought of using it uh, as the backdrop for some graphics where we might be able to actually draw boundaries or draw uh, points right on the imagery from the drone, whether that be photos or video, to uh, sort of combine those visual graphics with the photos and, and video. Um, and another thing that I think it would be useful for is just helping to inform reporters. So even if the photos or videos don't necessarily make it into the story, um, the reporters could still use that to get a better view of the situation and, and help them tell that story better, whether that's online or on air. Seems like it's an application that's here to stay. I think so. It's, it's new, and a lot of people are using it, and I think that it will the, it'll become more and more familiar to people. People will start to see uh, how it can help us tell the story in the best way we can. Thanks to St. Louis Public Radio data visual journalist Brent Jones talking about our recently acquired drone. To see how some of our drone coverage was used in a story earlier this week regarding the disposal of debris next to a school, visit stlpublicradio.org and type NGA Debris in the search box. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU.
Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.